Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our course on the Pentateuch. And you can see, if I move out of the way, you can see we are at the side of Interstate 70 in eastern central Utah. And if you can read the sign, you can see this is the town of Green River, Utah, 110 miles from the next exit. It's in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I come here to this remote location to talk about today's topic, the history of the diachronic research on the Pentateuch, because while a staple of every seminary Pentateuch course, it can feel a little bit like we're wandering in the wilderness, that we're talking about something that's not all that pertinent. I hope to show why this topic is important, why the history of the research into how the Pentateuch was composed, how the text came to be in its final form, I hope to show why that's important over the next 10 minutes and actually the next two classes, so the next 20 minutes. But this is a topic that in my experience is worth about a week of our class time, not the behemoth nearly half the semester it was when I was in seminary. So I hope you enjoy. Let's go ahead and look at our agenda for today. First, we're gonna look at what exactly is diachronic study? What is it exactly that we're doing and why are we doing it? Then we're gonna look at what the problem is. What question does diachronic study, that is historical critical analysis, what problem does it attempt to solve? And then we're gonna look at the history of possible solutions from the Middle Ages all the way till the beginning of the 20th century. So let's delve in first to the distinction between diachronic and synchronic analysis. Diachronic analysis, this comes from the Greek, dia meaning through, chronic, chronos meaning time, through time. Diachronic analysis explores how the text developed over time. How did it evolve? How did it go from its earliest traditions, perhaps oral traditions, pieces, fragments of written literature, something like that? How did it go from its origins, the events themselves way in the remote past, to the final form of the text that we have in our Bibles today? Diachronic analysis is the same thing as the historical critical method. They mean the same thing. Synchronic analysis is its opposite. Synchronic analyzes the text exclusively in the final form. It comes from the Greek meaning with time, syn meaning with, chronic again meaning time, and it's looking at literary approaches. We're looking at the text insofar as it manifests a narrative character, or insofar as it manifests a persuasive character, or the use of symbols in the literature, and there's other kinds as well. And the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1993 taught us that we need both. That diachronic analysis is absolutely indispensable. See, it says so, it's in the green on your screen right there. Diachronic study remains indispensable. Why? Because the text was written at a given moment in history. And we believe that ultimately Christ took on flesh within history. So history matters. However, it's insufficient. You'll notice in the blue and the black on your screen, it says that synchronic analysis of text, we must recognize that we are dealing here with a legitimate operation for it is the text in its final stage rather than its earlier editions, which is the expression of the word of God. And this is so important. While we're gonna talk in the next couple of classes about the sources of the Pentateuch and about the earlier editions that we think this literature had before the final form that we read in our Bibles, it is this final form that is inspired. It is this final form that is most important. At the end of the day, we're trying to interpret the Pentateuch as it currently exists, not how it hypothetically might have existed millennia ago. I would also point out that what the Pontifical Biblical Commission wrote here is also cited in Verbum Domini, in the magisterial document by Benedict XVI in 2010. So why do scholars do this kind of inquiry? Why do scholars ask about who wrote the Pentateuch? For a long time, the synagogue and the church agreed that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And we'll look a little bit later as to why they thought that. Let's look at a few reasons why that explanation is unpersuasive. First, we look at Genesis chapter 37, and this is the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob, being sold into slavery. Our speaker here is Judah, one of his brothers. Come, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites, instead of doing away with him ourselves. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. Midianite traders passed by, and they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern. They sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben went back to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not in it, he tore his garments. Who exactly sold Joseph into slavery? The grammar of this sentence implies that it was the Midianites who pulled Joseph out of the cistern, and it was the Midianites who sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. 
So what role do the brothers play? But we know from earlier in the context that the brothers wanted to sell him into slavery. What we think happened here is that there were two versions of this story that have been fused together. The Hebrew tradition, we think, had two different versions of the story that made sense on their own terms, and they were fused together a little less than elegantly. But it's not just in narratives that we see this. Also in legal texts, we have these three main norms from different legal codes. We have one from Exodus, one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus, all of which proscribe lending money at interest. They all have that in common, but the terms are different. Exodus forbids lending money to the poor of, quote unquote, my people, presumably the Lord's people. But how broad does that extend? Deuteronomy allowed interest to be collected from foreigners, but not Israelites. But Deuteronomy also added something. Deuteronomy says that not only can you not add interest to money lending, but you also can't lend property at interest to Israelites. And then Leviticus does something entirely different. It not only forbids interest, but it legislates an affirmative obligation to support poor kindred like a resident alien and allow them to live with them. Now imagine you're a judge. How do you apply this law? If you have an Israelite who is lending at interest and says, well, I lent it to a foreigner. How does that intersect with Exodus and Leviticus? Keep in mind all of this law, even up to the time of Jesus, this is all law written down, revealed by the Lord to Moses, at least according to the text. How is a judge to apply the law? There's some tension here. And then we have the famous doublets, that is two versions of the same story with significant differences, and some of these differences don't neatly work themselves out. So scholars, having faced these problems, begin to propose a number of different solutions, and some of these solutions go back even to the Middle Ages. As you can see on your screen, the traditional position that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which we think incidentally came because of Hellenistic culture, that in Greek culture of the third century BC and thereabouts, held that for a work to be great, it had to have a great author. This position starts to be displaced already by Abraham Ibn Ezra in the Middle Ages, but it's the Renaissance when scholars began reading the Pentateuch in its original Hebrew. Again, that's one of the major differences that comes with the Renaissance, is that scholarship begins to take place in the original languages. So after the Renaissance, three different people, Baruch Spinoza, who's Jewish, Richard Simon, who was Catholic, and Henning Bernhard Witter, who was Protestant, all began to question Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. And three basic hypotheses emerged. The documentary hypothesis holds that the Pentateuch is composed of a number of different independent documents, whereas the fragmentary hypothesis held that it was composed of smaller, incomplete pieces of text. And then the complementary supplementary hypothesis held that there was one base document, there was one long form document onto which different supplements or complements were added over time. All of this research comes to a head in the 19th century with the classical documentary hypothesis proposed by Julius Wellhausen, which proposed four sources, the J, the Yahwist, which begins with a J in German, the Eloist, the Deuteronomist, and the Priestly, J, E, D, and P. You can see on your screen when Wellhausen proposed each of these sources to have been written and by whom. But Wellhausen's approach had two main limitations. One was that it was biased. Wellhausen was a Lutheran, of late 19th century Germany. He did not think much of anything priestly. He did not think much of Jews, nor did he think much of Catholics. Just remind yourself of the Kulturkampf from Otto von Bismarck, you've got it. Also, he was biased towards what he saw was the earlier, this Hegelian romantic preference for the past. Hermann Gunkel began Old Testament form criticism, looking for the oral origins of biblical texts. And then Gerhard von Rad started tradition criticism, and then Martin Noth proposed the theory of the Deuteronomistic history. That is the idea that the main historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, were all written along with Deuteronomy in the same school of thought. This has just been an initial study. In our next class, we're gonna look and see what happened both in the Catholic Church and what happened later in the 20th century. Until then, read well and pray well.